Hey everyone, welcome to the latest episode of OPG Live. So glad that you could all join us and very glad to have our sponsor Tamron sponsoring this event. So thank you for that. Uh, today is going to be an exciting episode. I am professional nature photographer Ian Plant and I'm here with Lilia Khalif from Outdoor Photography Guide. Lilia, how are you today? <laughs> I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm doing great. She told me ahead of the episode that I threw <laughs> her off last time because I asked her how she was doing. Yeah, I was so. in the zone ready to ask questions yes. and ask me about myself. She's not used to getting questions, so no, yeah. that's about as personal as we're going to get. <laughs> so well, I'm glad to hear that you're doing yes. well. Vital information. Yes. Are you going to ask me about what I've been up to lately? What have you been up to, Ian? Thank you. I have uh, just gotten back from an exciting photo adventure to the Badlands of South Dakota, and then I decided that the Badlands there just weren't bad enough. I needed bad more enough. bad Badlands. So <laughs> I went to Utah, which has got some of the baddest Badlands you can find mm -hmm. anywhere. These Badlands are totally bad. So, so bad. Yeah, they're very, well, they're actually really awesome. And <laughs> I had a, a really fun time photographing these two landscapes. Now, you know, Utah and South Dakota aren't two landscapes that most people would put together. They don't think of one and then think of the other. Yeah. I think most people would think that these states are very different, but the landscapes are actually very similar, though the, the Utah landscapes are maybe a bit more dramatic than what you find mm. in the Dakota Badlands. But both of them are very similar in the sense that these are uh, landscapes that are dominated by these soft clay uh, Badlands. So basically most of the the rock that's there is really just a soft clay that erodes very quickly. And you have all these interesting erosion patterns there and then all of this cracked mud. So the, the two landscapes, despite their differences, are actually quite similar. Yeah. And I used very similar techniques to photograph both of these locations. And we'll talk a little bit about that more. But just a reminder to send in your questions during the live event. We also have a brand new question chat box below the video, so make sure you check it out and you can just enter in as a guest and ask all your questions in there. I'll be monitoring it, so ask as many questions as you can so we can answer as many as we can before the live event ends. Yes, I will do my best to answer as many questions as I can before we're done today. I know we can't get to everyone's questions, so as always, I encourage people to submit uh, thoughtful questions that are also <laughs> funny. That will increase your chances of having your question read out live on the air and answered by me. So we're going to get into, we'll dive into questions whenever they come in, mm -hmm. but I thought maybe I would start by showing some of the photos that I took on my recent photo adventures. So we're going to go right into that. Let's go into the photos. This is a shot from Badlands National Park in South Dakota. And uh, what I was saying earlier about how these, these two landscapes, the one in uh, South Dakota and the one in Utah, are dominated by these soft clay badlands. This is a very good illustration of that. Uh, the, this clay is uh, it's not a hard rock, so it erodes very quickly when there's any rain. And even though both of these locations are semi-arid and don't get a lot of rain, when they do get rain, it tends to come down really hard and heavy. And the rain carves all these channels into the soft clay. Actually, the, the, the Badlands become impassable after rain for several oh. hours because that mud is very thick. And if you try walking through it, you end up falling through. Uh, but then the mud very quickly hardens and dries in the intense heat that is in this area, especially during the summer. And then it cracks. So you get all these cracked mud patterns. And the, the patterns themselves are really interesting. But what I really love about these Badlands formations is the colors. You get uh, a veritable rainbow of colors in the rock. There's reds, there's yellows, there's oranges, there's blues, there's purples, there's greens. Basically every color you can imagine is represented in pastel form in uh, the clay badlands that are in these areas. So there's a lot of color to work with and a lot of pattern. And so for this particular photo, this is really all about the erosion lines. So these erosion lines that are represented in the shot are very small. They're maybe uh, one or two inches deep. They're not very big. Maybe in about 10 or 20,000 years, one of these will become the next Grand Canyon. Hmm. But for now, they're actually quite small, but they're very distinct. So I spent a lot of time scouring the landscape on foot, looking for these distinct erosion patterns to serve as a foreground in my landscape compositions. And so for this particular shot, we can go into the Telestrator here. And Ooh. I can, yes, very exciting. I can. Uh, demonstrate <laughs> exactly what I was thinking when I was taking the photo. So let's pick a color. Uh, Lilia, what color do you want? I feel a lot of pressure here. Okay. I don't know, do blue. It blue. Kind of goes with All the right. sky a little so, bit. <laughs> so basically I'm on the hunt for interesting shapes that will lead 
the viewer's eye from the foreground down here into the background of the composition. So that's always what I'm searching for, is to find a way to compel the viewer to go from the bottom of the image frame up to the top of the image. So what you end up creating when you do a composition like this, this is called the near-far style of landscape photography, and you end up with a visual juxtaposition between the near elements in the composition, the bottom of the photo and the top. And also, when I'm making these photos, I think not only about what's going on uh, with my foreground, but what might be going on with my background and my sky. So I try to add some additional visual interest into these photos. So for this particular shot, I have this compelling radial pattern in the foreground, and when I had some clouds drifting in in the background at sunset that were lighting up with some beautiful purple color, those clouds created that same radial shape which complemented the shapes in the foreground. And you can see here, here's another example of a shot I took in Badlands National Park. And here, once again, I'm using these erosion patterns to create a foreground that leads the viewer's eye into the middle ground, the background, and then the sky of the image. Having this visual progression is very important when you're trying to make compelling landscape photos. So once again, we'll go into the Telestrator effect. This is just like in uh, uh, Sports Center, except uh, <laughs> I think this is a little less exciting. <laughs> Um, so you can see here, I, I had these two very bold lines that were formed by this white chalk that was in this red clay formation. And there's some additional visual interest with these uh, little squiggly erosion lines. And these lines, the smaller lines, run counter to the bolder lines. And this just enhances visual interest. It gets the eye moving back and forth. And all of this leads to that radiating pattern mm -hmm. of clouds in the sunrise sky. Can I sneak a clay question in here? Sure, you I may. don't know if you can answer this, because <laughs> you're a photographer and maybe not so much a fun, fun fact, actually. environmentalist. Fun fact, I, oh. I'm, I grew up in the town of Clay, New York. Oh, so, so technically you're a clay expert. Today. Yes, I guess I'm a clay expert, though the town wasn't named after dirt, it was named after mm -hmm. Senator Henry Clay, who was oh. a southern senator in the 1800s who made a visit to upstate New York and the townspeople were so impressed that they named they the named clay. they renamed their town uh, after him. But yes, I am a, I'm ready for any clay questions. All right. Well, Denny asks, why is the top of clay gray while the bottom is red? The top <laughs> to of you know clay, that. you mean the top of the clay here? Yeah, so you have no like okay. you have those chalky outlines. Yeah. What makes the chalky outlines? I, I'm not exactly sure. So the, there's basically multiple layers of sediment that mm -hmm. have been deposited here. I'm not a geologist or a clay expert, despite the fact that I just pretended that I was. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are multiple layers. You can see the layering. If we go back to the photo here, you can see the layering in the background all here, yeah. these distinct layers. So this is multiple layers of sediment that were laid down over centuries of a millennium of deposits. And as the, the landscape erodes, you get these different layers revealed. So that white chalky uh, clay that we see at the top there might have been the result of just one layer of sediment that was revealed. And um, it's, it's almost completely eroded away. And most of it's gone and it's revealing the red layer that's beneath it. So that might be one possibility, I'm not entirely sure. Do you think also on the ground, like the different colors are from the clay drying and getting wet, and it's advantageous for a photographer to be there at times where it may be in the process of drying and not fully dry so that you get that gradient of colors? Well, that, that's actually a fantastic question. The, the best times I've photographed that landscape have been right after it's rained, okay. in particular because the erosion patterns look very distinct mm. after they've had a lot of rain washing through them. It washes out all the dirt and the dust that might pile up, so they look a lot stronger right after rain. Of course, you have to wait until that mud dries, yeah. because I have tried to walk in that landscape after rain, and you get maybe about one foot before your entire boot is covered in mud, and, it and it's just sticky, and it won't come yeah. off. And the only way you get out of that is by stepping out of your boot, and you lose the boot. <laughs> so I don't recommend it. I recommend that, you, that you're there when there is a storm, and then you wait for it to dry before going out and exploring the landscape. Mm. So. There's the clay question. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic <laughs> question. So we'll, we'll, we'll go back to more photos of clay and the uh, compositional effect that uh, you can get when you're working with this clay subject. So in this particular photo, you can see there's lots of leading lines, lots of really great patterns. And as I said before, I'm always looking for these really distinct erosion patterns. I'm trying to find a compelling foreground feature that's going to lead into the middle ground and background areas of the photo. And 
you know, this is a very good example of what it is that I'm looking for. These lines are very strong and they, they just compel the viewer to go deeper into the composition. So you go from this foreground area, then to the middle ground, then there's the background, and then there's the patterns in the sky. So this creates basically four very distinct areas of visual progression within the composition. So that's why foreground is so important is it helps create this more dynamic visual relationship. It helps lead the viewer's eye in. And all these things help make more compelling landscape photos. But as important as foreground is, the other elements, the middle ground, the background, the sky, these other layers of visual interest are also very important and something you have to think about. Your trick as a landscape photographer is to explore the landscape until you can find those compositions where all these elements come together. So usually what I do is I look for a good foreground that leads into really nice and dramatic background scenery. And then I determine whether that spot's going to work for sunrise or sunset. And I go back to that location when I think it's going to be best. And I wait for the right light. I'm waiting for the right clouds to move in that create the right shapes that complement the shapes in the foreground. And hopefully I'm going to get some great light to bring it all together. But sometimes I have to go back multiple occasions for the same composition. So if I develop something that I really like, I go back over and over again until I finally get the light and the weather that brings it all together. All right, so let's go, oops, I want to cancel that. Hold on a second. <laughs> Technological errors. And let me just uh, get rid of all the, actually, I don't think it matters. Let's just go ahead and there we go. And go to the next photo. So. Outside of the Badlands National Park, there are more Badlands formations on public land. And although you can't legally fly a drone inside the park, there are plenty of opportunities in the lands that are outside of the park where you can fly the drone. And I love flying the drone and doing photography for my drone over this, this landscape because that's when the colors and the patterns really come out in a very strong way. And I had a great time exploring aerial perspectives of these Badlands formations. And I just really love looking from above at how the patterns emerge from the landscape. Patterns are very important to whatever type of photography you're doing. When you have a pattern, it's something that attracts the viewer's eye and it gets them engaged visually within your composition. So whenever I can make patterns a part of my composition or even make the pattern the defining feature of the composition, I look for those opportunities to do so. I think it can be very, very powerful when you're making landscape photos or any kind of photos for that matter. So uh, there was plenty of patterns that I got to play with and the, the erosion lines that you see when um, you're making ground-based perspectives, as you get higher with an aerial perspective, and you can do it with a drone. I think there's also helicopter flights that you can take when you're in Badlands National Park where you can fly over the park. Did you, quick question, did mm -hmm. you lose a drone on this trip? I did not lose a drone oh, on this trip. Oh, yeah. first and, time. Well, as a matter of fact, I was flying <laughs> the, the brand new DJI Mavic 2 Pro drone. What drone number is this for you? Like, this is my fourth or fifth fourth drone, time. I think. Okay. And I, I also had some of my, one of my old Phantoms that I had crashed and repaired. Oh. And uh, I really like the new Mavic Mavic uh, uh, 2 Pro, it's a fantastic drone. It's a lot harder for me to crash it. It's more <laughs> idiot proof, so oh, that's perfect that's for me. That's good. Yeah. So, but um, when I would get this aerial perspective that those erosion patterns that you would see from the ground suddenly get writ large over the entire landscape and some really beautiful patterns would emerge, something that you couldn't see from a ground pace perspective. So I really like the unique angle I was getting on the drone and I would fly my drone at sunrise or sunset to try to get some mixed light on the landscape because that's also when the colors really come out. You'll have some warm sunrise lighting on parts of the landscape and then the rest of the landscape might be in deep shadow. And those areas, because it, there's a lot of white clay in these rocks, anything that's in shadow will end up looking a bit bluer in tone because it's lit primarily from light reflecting from the blue sky above. Mm -hmm. And anything in the light uh, at sunrise or sunset will have this golden color to it. So it was a really great way of revealing some interesting colors that might not be apparent to the eye normally and that are revealed through the photographic process. So to me, the, the aerial perspectives were a great way to study the intersection of light, shadow, and pattern. And I had a lot of fun making these photos. I would also, you know, usually when I'm doing, 
landscape photography, when I have uh, the possibility of getting really good sunrises or sunsets, like if I've got a lot of clouds in the sky, so I think there might be a colorful sunrise or sunset, I usually do land-based photography. And when I have just sunny weather, the land-based photography isn't going to be that interesting because I'm not going to have those clouds in the sky to bring my compositions together. That's when I would fly the drone, but sometimes I would also fly the drone when there were clouds in the sky because it was nice to get an aerial perspective and have a really nice sunset or sunrise sky in the background. So for this shot, I uh, had one of those aerial perspectives. I had some great clouds that lit up, so I had some good color in the sky, and I was able to play around with the shapes and the patterns in ways that I couldn't have done on the land. And let's go ahead and... Quick questions sure. in here. Since we're in these photos, we have a few questions about the photos. Yes. I don't know if you can recall all this information, but Eric asks, best. is it possible for you to tell us any of the camera settings you use to create these photos? Um, yes, I can talk a little bit about the camera settings. Erica, uh, do you have a preference for knowing about the drone settings or the land-based settings? The, uh, not in that question, but also Tan Man also asks, are these photos straight from the drone or have they been touched at all? So maybe on the drone photos you could talk about that well, as well. Well, sure. I mean, you know, all, all of these files are digital files, so they have been edited in a raw processor, uh, but they haven't been uh, what I would call like highly edited. There's, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of monkey business going on. This is, you know, these are photos that I optimize, but that are very faithful to the colors as it appeared. Uh, in the through the photographic process mm -hmm. um, in terms of the settings I mean you know with the the drone I guess the settings are a little less relevant because when you're flying a few hundred feet above the ground it's easy to get depth of field even with very uh, mm -hmm. big apertures uh, so the, the the actual camera settings for the land-based photography is probably more relevant with my land-based near far wide-angle compositions I'm typically shooting at f11 or f16 to make sure I get enough depth of field from near to far to get everything in sharp focus. Or I'm also doing a technique called focus stacking, which is when you take multiple exposures of the same shot and all you do is vary the focus point between each shot and then you blend those together. This allows you to make sure that you get everything from near to far or sharply focused and you don't have to worry about depth of field when you're using focus stacking. Both of these techniques are described in my uh, ebook and video course, Focusing for Landscape Photography which is available on the OPG shop. All right. So, all right, let's go back into the photos. And I am going to just talk about the composition here, which I think is pretty straightforward. And what I did is I saw this pattern uh, that was revealed in the sediment of the rock that creates this sort of curve or zigzag that goes from near to far in the composition. So I'm always looking for these shapes for these patterns that'll help get the eye moving throughout the composition. And usually when they're moving back and forth, like an S-curve or a zigzag, that creates more visual interest. And so that line leads from the lower right to the upper left. And then there's this peak in the background that acts as a counterpoint element. So the line takes you in this way, and then the eye is drawn to the peak. So that creates some visual tension, gets the eye moving back and forth. And this is how you create compositional excitement. This is how you make your compositions more interesting and more compelling to the viewers by thinking about all of these compositional techniques. So I'm always on the lookout for interesting shapes, interesting patterns. Here's another drone shot. Actually, this shot was accomplished by stitching a bunch of shots together. So I oh. vertically panned the camera of the drone up and then down so that I could stitch them together to create this vertical view of the full moon rising over these badland formations. Uh, and then I moved on to Utah. So I spent a lot of time doing uh, a fair amount of photography in South Dakota. And then I went to photograph a different set of badlands in the south central Utah area, one of my favorite spots to go, because you can do a lot of drone photography in this particular area. There's no national parks or anything like that. And there's some really beautiful formations. And uh, so I did a mix of land-based photography and uh, air-based photography when I was in Utah. And this is one of the shots that I took there from the drone, a few hundred feet above the ground. All these beautiful and colorful patterns that are revealed uh, to the eye when you have an aerial perspective. It's something you just really don't see when you're on the ground. And so once again, I was focusing on the patterns. The, the, the patterns in Utah are a little bit different. They're, uh, they're perhaps a bit more grand and a bit more intricate, um, but it's the same sort of thing. I'm looking for the patterns, looking for the colors. Uh, there was a lot of different opportunities. Like There was these beautiful panels of cracked mud that I found when I was in Utah, and each of these panels is maybe about a foot or two across, so they're actually quite big. And there was a lot of interesting opportunities to make shots from the ground with these 
cracked mud panels, but I liked getting up a little higher with the aerial perspective. So I was flying my drone, I don't know, maybe 20 feet, 15 feet above the ground, and I was able to get a perspective that was a lot different. So I'm always looking for opportunities to find new and interesting perspectives. And you can do that when you're on the land. You can do that with, when you're in the air. Uh, always what I'm looking for, as I said, is looking for these patterns that emerge from the landscape or that emerge from the interaction of light and shadow. So for this particular photograph, the shapes that emerge, the pattern that emerge, is the result of that last light of sunset hitting the tops of these ridges and then everything else falling into shadow. So it's the interplay of light and shadow here that creates the compositional shapes. So the shapes don't always have to be the native shape of the object. They can be the shape that emerges when you have light on part of the scene and the rest is in darkness. And you know, this is another example. This is more of a, of a color-based pattern. So the, the tops of these ridges were yellow. The clay that was in the valleys of these ridges was a different color. It was primarily this whitish blue. And so that contrast of color is what creates the shapes, creates the pattern here in this shot. So it can be the contrast of light and shadow, or it can be the contrast of color that helps reveal these interesting compositions. And here's another shot of some of that cracked mud that I was talking about earlier, this time with some light on it. And you can see how having some light, creating some shadows, can change the overall look of the composition. So if we comp compare that to this shot, uh, it ends up being a much different composition as a result of having some nice, colorful sunrise light on the shot. And here's another example of an aerial perspective. And uh, what I really like about this composition is the fact that the Badlands on the right side look somewhat like a feather or maybe like yeah. a, a leaf that's fallen. You can see the veins and the leaf there. And then there's more intricate patterns to the left. So there's this area of contrast. It's contrast in terms of the texture and the complexity of the landscape. It's contrast in terms of the color of the landscape. Looking for these areas of contrast, looking for these distinct patterns that emerge from the landscape is a good strategy whether you're flying in the air or you're on the land. And just a few more examples of some of the patterns that I was able to find while flying my drone over the landscape. There was some sand dunes in the area where I was photographing. So uh, sand dunes are really fantastic for doing this shape-based and pattern photography. And once again, it's the interplay of light and shadow that reveals the shape. So as the sun got low at sunset, it was casting this very warm, colorful light on the dune landscape, revealing all these shapes. These shapes disappear when the sun's higher or when the sun's down, because without the interplay of light and shadow, there's just a mass of sand. Uh, so when the light is selectively hitting parts of the dunes, the top parts of the ridges that are exposed to that last light or that first light at sunset or sunrise, that's when these shapes and patterns emerge. And this one kind of, I don't know, it looks a little bit like maybe uh, some sort of sinister devil figure with horns, um, or perhaps it. maybe a human body or something like that. Uh, you know, squint your eyes and you imagine <laughs> something. I don't know. Does Make it a look, shape. It's yeah. like looking at a cloud. I, exactly. You know, I tell people that if you really want to excel at photographic composition, you have to play the game that you played when you were a little kid, where you're mm -hmm. staring up at the clouds and you're seeing the shapes. Oh, look, I've just seen a bunny rabbit or something yeah. like that. That game is really, in essence, what composition is all about. You're looking for shapes that uh, remind you of something or that are somehow visually compelling that grab your attention and you're putting those shapes arranging them in your composition to make something that is compelling to the viewer that draws them in deeper both emotionally and visually into your photo compositions when you can bring the viewer into your shots and and just don't let go you hold their interest over time that's when you've made a successful photograph so going back into the photos uh, I, you know, even though I was doing a fair amount of aerial work when I was there, I do manage, I do try to get out and do land-based photography as well. And I, I was exploring these bedlands. They're very difficult to explore because there's a lot of ups and downs. But once again, even though I was on the ground, I was looking for using these patterns to uh, help create an interesting composition. So for this particular shot, we'll go into the uh, Sports Center Telestrator again. <laughs> Uh, I found these deep erosion patterns. And these erosion patterns, once again, you got to find ones that are going to stand out, that are going to make an interesting and obvious shape. So looking for a compelling foreground is what I probably spend 90% of my time doing. And these all lead the eye uh, 
into that interesting background, which is the, the big mesa that's in the background there. So this is a wide angle perspective. I was shooting with my 11 to 24 millimeter lens. I was probably at 11 millimeters. And once again, I used uh, focus stacking just to, to optimize the sharpness from near to far. It's a technique that I use increasingly when I'm doing my landscape photography. I, I never really did it before. I used to always focus the old fashioned way using hyperfocal distance. But I've been doing focus stacking a lot more because it just, it just allows you to get really cleaner, sharper, crisper images and allows you to play with more extreme perspectives, those extreme near far perspectives. <coughs> Excuse me. And so this was a composition that I, um, I rather liked, but uh, what I desperately needed for this photograph was some great skies. Mm. And as you can see here, it was sunny weather. Sunny weather isn't always ideal for landscape photography. Tourists love it, but landscape photographers hate it <laughs> because you don't really have that interest in the sky. And when I don't have the clouds in the sky, usually what happens is if I'm doing ground-based landscape photography, on a sunny day. I end up excluding most of the sky from the shot, as you can see from that particular photo. So I didn't get the light I wanted for that shot. So I went back when things looked more favorable. And one day, even though the forecast said it was going to be sunny, sunny, sunny the whole time I was there, one day these massive winds built up. We're talking about gale force winds oh. that would knock, were knocking me over. It made it very <laughs> difficult to walk. But the winds were having a local weather effect. They were, they were interacting with the high desert plains in a way that created all these clouds. So as the winds built up, these massive storm clouds built up over the landscape. So I decided I was going to gamble and take a shot at going back to that location from the photo I just showed you and try again. And you know, I was going to try a slightly different spot, but I wanted to have that mesa in the background. And it, that mesa was basically on the edge where the clouds were. It was clear, sunny skies to the west of that mesa. And it was beautiful, stormy clouds to the east of that mesa. So I figured it was a bit of a gamble. If I went there and then the winds began to die down, the clouds would recede and I could lose my clouds altogether mm -hmm. uh, because I was just on the edge. Also, there was a distinct possibility that the clouds would build up even more and completely cover the western sky. Uh, but I went for it because when you have conditions like that, when, you have, when, you, when you've got those mostly to partly cloudy skies, when you've got those stormy skies, uh, even if the odds seem a little long to you, uh, it's a good idea to be a gambler and to throw all of your effort into being on location at that spot because if it pays off, you're going to hit the jackpot. And that's exactly what happened for me when I I went into this location. I spent two hours exploring the landscape, looking for a, uh, a good spot to photograph. You know, I'm looking for that interesting foreground. And I found it. And I also was rewarded with this incredibly beautiful sunset sky. So everything came together. And it came together in ways that were more perfect than I ever could have imagined. Because I had these interesting lines in these erosion patterns in the clay that led from the foreground to the background. What I didn't know, what I couldn't anticipate, was that at sunset, when those storm clouds began to break up, that they would create these fingers of light, which were only revealed because the clouds were being selectively lit by the setting sun. So basically, the clouds were like sand ripples in the sky uh, that were inverted. And just some of the clouds that were a little bit lower were catching the light. And the result is a repetition of the shapes from the foreground into the, uh, the sky. So here, uh, going into the Sports Center Telestrator, you can see I've got all of this, uh, these lines coming together in the foreground, creating this radiating pattern that are mirrored by the radiating pattern formed by the light striking the clouds in the sky. So, these two patterns mirror each other, they complement each other, and the end result is everything I wanted in a land-based landscape photo. I had a great foreground, I had a scenic background, and I had a stunning, colorful sunset sky that brought it all together. And the key thing here also was the strength and intensity and color of the light. Because there were so many clouds in the sky, they lit up at sunset. And those clouds act like a giant reflector. And they bounced all of that warm light 
down onto the landscape. So the end result is this really colorful landscape photo. So this is what I'm always dreaming about when I'm making landscape photos is a scene like that, hoping it'll all come together perfectly. And this is why, by the way, I spend as much time in the field as possible at, a, at like one location. I know a lot of people, when they're out there making photos, they tend to run and gun. If you're on a photo trip, you might go to a place for a day or two and then move on to the next. You want to see a lot of stuff and you want to photograph a lot of stuff. And chances are you'll make a lot of okay photos when you're doing that. But my recommendation is to slow things down and spend more time at a given area because it takes you a while to go out and find the really compelling compositions. And then you have to wait for that perfect combination of light and weather to come in and make everything come together. So if I can, I will spend at least a week at a given location, working that location, learning its rhythms, learning how the local weather works. Uh, usually I'll try to spend even more time. You know, the ideal amount of time in a location for me is often two weeks. And I will sit there and I will work the same compositions over and over again. In the middle of the day, I'll just keep scouting, looking for new compositions, and I'll continually refine my approach until I find the very best, most compelling compositions, and then I get the leather, the, the, the weather and the, the light, leather. the leather, yeah. <laughs> Uh, maybe I just need to wear the leather maybe. while I'm waiting for the weather to come together in a perfect way. So my advice is definitely spend time with the subject that you're photographing. Make sure you've got enough time to make not just a few okay shots or even a bunch of good shots. Make sure you've got the time to make at least one really spectacular shot on every trip that you make. I think you'll be a lot happier with just one spectacular shot than you will be with 20 or 30 good shots. Yeah. All so. right. Are we ready for some questions? Yes, absolutely. I hope there's some All great right. questions here. Oh, from I got pressure now. Yeah. Well, our first question is from Beth, who's asking a very seasonal question. Okay. Um, what is the best way to get a landscape of fall colors with a blown out sky? The best way to get a landscape of fall, fall colors, colors with a blown out sky? Yeah. Or, is or that maybe they're saying without, without a blown, a blown out sky? Without a blown out sky? <laughs> um, so obviously the best time to photograph uh, fall color is during autumn. And uh, I guess I didn't really need to say that because uh, it was very obvious. But I did start off by maybe saying they obviously. Didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> Go in October, look at your peak fall colors chart. Definitely. And for those of us living in the Northern Hemisphere, fall is right around the corner, yeah. October and uh, maybe early November for various locations in the United States are peak fall color times. For those of you living in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, October will not be the time for peak fall color. That's probably going to be more like March and April for you guys. Huh. Um, so it's all reversed down there. You yeah, know? yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to encourage you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, so I guess you know the question is you know how do you avoid those blown out skies? Well, it depends on what kind of sky you've got behind the fall color. So if you're photographing fall color on a sunny day, it's pretty easy to get uh, the fall color juxtaposed against that that bright blue sky, and it's going to look really great because having that blue juxtaposed against those brilliant reds and those yellows is really fantastic for photography. It creates this complementary color scheme, which is really nice. So those color opposites, the warm versus cool tones. Coming together in one photo is really great. Uh, you know, certainly you can use the same strategies I use for most of my landscape photography, waiting for those epic sunrise and sunset skies where the storm clouds build up and you get some great light. Uh, you know, if you've got one of those brilliant sunsets going on behind a grove of trees that are just you know peaking with fall color, that can be a really beautiful effect. Uh, it's the direction that you choose that will determine uh, whether the landscape and the sky are more balanced in their exposure. So if you've got light on your landscape subject, then it's going to be easier for you to balance the exposure with the sky that's behind it. So if you're shooting away from the light, if the light's behind you, um, and, 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 and it's hitting stuff in front of you, it's going to be easier to balance your exposure. If you're shooting into the light, things become a lot trickier. In either event, one thing that photographers use to help balance their exposures between the sky and the landscape down below is something called a graduated neutral density filter, which you slide over the front of your lens, and the top part of the filter is darker than the bottom part. And you put the dark part over the sky, and that darkens that bright sky, so it helps balance the exposure with a shadowed landscape beneath it. So this is a good strategy for helping you to balance the exposure between sky and the landscape. All right. 
Oh, now we have three questions from Alexander. One of them you already asked, you already answered because we talked about focus stacking earlier. But um, the first one is, what lens aperture do you use most of the time? Do you have like a go-to aperture setting? Yeah, so for most of my landscape photography, I would say f11 is my go-to aperture. And usually, if I'm doing just traditional hyperfocal distance uh, focusing, and trying to find the optimal focus point between near and far to extend depth of field. For most of my landscape shots, when I do that f11 or maybe f16, somewhere in between those two is going to be the aperture that gives me enough depth of field so I can get that near far sharp focus effect. When I'm focus stacking, I usually use f8 or f11. So the reason I do that, even though you don't need that extra depth of field when you're focus stacking, most wide angle lenses, and that's typically what I'm using for my landscape photography, are sharpest from edge to edge, from center to corner, at about f8. So what happens is when you're shooting wide open with most wide angle lenses, the center might be sharp, but the corners and the edges aren't quite as sharp. And as you stop down, the performance of the lens gets more even. But as you stop down past f8, you start getting an effect called diffraction. And diffraction is an optical effect that slightly reduces overall image quality. So you have more of the scene that appears to be in focus because your depth of field gets extended when you're using smaller apertures. But everything, even though it's, it appears to be sharper in focus, there's just this little loss of image quality. And it gets more pronounced as you use these smaller apertures. So f16 and f22 in particular, you're going to notice the effects of diffraction. So, when I'm doing focus stacking, f8 for most lenses is usually when the lens has the best performance across the entire image frame. f11 is usually pretty good because the diffraction effects of f11 for most lenses is typically pretty small. You don't notice it anything. So when I'm focus stacking, uh, I'll typically use f8, but I often use f11 anyways because it just gives me a little extra depth of field as I'm making my focus stack increments in the field. It just gives me a little bit more leeway between shots. The worst thing you can do when you're focus stacking is not to have enough uh, images in your focus stack. So you change the focus incrementally when you're doing the focus stacking from the nearest part of your composition to the farthest part. And if you make the gaps too big when you're blending those images on the computer, there might, be, there might not be enough data. There might be one image where you have too much out of focus and the next image doesn't cover the same area and you have somewhere in the middle of your composition, you've got this zone that's out of focus. So that's something you want to avoid. So doing small increments will help you avoid that. And giving yourself just a little bit more depth of field with each of the focus stack increments that you make will extend that zone of apparent sharpness more so that there's less chance that you're going to make an error. So that's why f11 is often my go-to aperture for landscape work. All right. OK. And the other question that he asked was, how often do you use a standard zoom 24 to 70 millimeter? OK. So when I'm doing landscape work, I basically <laughs> typically bring three lenses with me, my 11 okay. to 24, my 24 to 70, and then my 70 to 200. Or right now, I'm using a 70 to 210, uh, which is uh, one of Tamron's lenses. And uh, I would say that probably about 95% of my landscape work is with my 11 to 24. <laughs> so <laughs> of the remaining... So maybe not very often. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm a wide angle guy. What can I say? Yeah. Uh, of the remaining shots that I take, probably more of those are with the 24 to 70. Um, and then very few are with the 70 to 200 or longer focal length. Mm -hmm. So 24 to 70 is an interesting focal length. I think this lends itself... Uh, very easily to what I call the classic style of landscape photography. So if you think back to the days of Ansel Adams, you know, he started off that, that sort of near far uh, composition for landscape photography, mm -hmm. but I don't think you can really characterize any of his photos as having an extreme near far perspective. So he was using these middle focal lengths, these quote unquote normal focal lengths, and they, they lend themselves to a bit more of a, of a traditional perspective. They match uh, a little bit closer the perspective that we see with our eyes, or at least in terms of the size of objects in the composition. Yeah. And so um, for many decades, landscape photography was dominated by lenses in this middle focal range. And so you, had, you still had these near-far compositions, this, you know, this progression from foreground to middle ground to background to sky, 
with these compositions, but it wasn't very extreme in the perspective. It was a much more natural perspective, more of a what I would call a postcard perspective. <laughs> um, and certainly when you see a lot of postcards at places, you, you tend to, you know, these are shots that were taken with those yeah. lenses. So uh, with a super wide angle, you end up getting these more extreme perspectives. You end up making the foregrounds look a lot bigger and more prominent in the shot, and the backgrounds a bit smaller uh, and less prominent in the shot. So the more extreme perspective that's offered when using a wide angle lens uh, is, uh, is a bit more bold uh, and arguably somewhat more compelling than the more traditional standard uh, near far compositions that we saw in landscape photography for many years. So there's nothing wrong with the 24 to 70. It's just not my personal style of shooting, so yeah. I don't use it that much. I always carry it, and I always think of my, to myself, why am I carrying this <laughs> lens? I never use it. But it's there when I do need it, and on, on occasion, I do, I do reach for it. For that few times, just to have right. it, it's nice. All right, our next question is from Anya, who asks, what settings would you use to create the sun starburst effect in your photos? Okay, so the starburst effect is when you're shooting into the sun with a wide-angle lens, and the sun is rendered as a, a basically a starburst. So it's pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. And with just about you know, any lens that you use, you can get that starburst effect. But the effect looks better when you use smaller apertures. And it's also more pronounced when you're using wider angle shots. It's going to be much less pronounced with longer lenses. Um, but the smaller the aperture you use, the better the sun star looks. And with some lenses, actually, the sun star doesn't really start looking good until you start using those really small apertures. Mm -hmm. Other lenses are a little bit better. And you can get a good sun star at f8 or f11. But usually, to get that really crisply defined sun star, you've got to stop, stop down to f16 or f22. Now, of course, that creates diffraction problems that I mentioned earlier, where you will lose just a little bit of image quality if you're using those really small apertures. But definitely, you should experiment with your lens, because not all lenses create sun stars equally. Mm. Arguably, the more expensive, uh, quote unquote, pro lenses will create a better defined sun star than some of the, the cheaper uh, prosumer or consumer lenses. And uh, so you should test to see what the sun star looks like with your lens and which aperture seems to render it the best. So experiment freely and assess the results. That's my advice. Try it out for yourself. All right, we talked quite a bit about focus stacking, but another question mm -hmm. about it. Rudy asks, what focus stacking software do you use? Okay, so I use a program called Helicon Focus, oh. which is a dedicated focus stacking program. Uh, you can, there's a number of other programs out there that I've heard of that I've never tried, so I won't you know, recommend them or not. Yeah. Helicon Focus seems to work great for me. Never had any problems with it. Uh, you can also do focus stacking in Adobe Photoshop, but it's a bit of a complicated process. It's not too difficult if you're comfortable with Photoshop, but if you've never used it, I would recommend instead working with something like Helicon Focus. Helicon Focus also, if you're an Adobe Lightroom user, it does uh, work with Lightroom. Uh, I, I've never done it myself because I'm not a Lightroom user, yep. but I have heard in theory that it does. So it's something that uh, is going to be a lot, really easy for a lot of Lightroom users to integrate Helicon Focus into their workflow. Oh, all right. Our next question is from Kimmy, who asks, manual focus or autofocus? Do you have a preference? Ah, so great question. And I get this question a lot, uh, as a matter of fact, especially when I'm leading workshops. Because a lot of people like to use autofocus on landscape, which seems peculiar to me, because I've always done manual focus with my landscape photography. Oh, really? <laughs> but part of the reason why <laughs> is I started landscape photography with one of those old style Ansel Adams oh, okay. field cameras that where you throw the hood over your head and oh. all that stuff. And those are all manual focus. So that's just how I learned landscape photography. Yeah. So I do manual focusing with landscape photography because it's easier to set a hyperfocal focus point if you're doing it manually. Yeah. Also, it makes focus stacking a lot easier because what I do is I figure out, basically what I do is I focus on the closest object in my composition. And then from there, I'll do my focus stack, moving the lens in very small increments until I get all the way to the background, uh, which is the infinity mark for uh, most landscape scenes. Uh, so if you've got a lens that actually has a distance scale on it, it's really easy to use manual focus to do focus stacking. But I do realize that especially some of the mirrorless cameras have lenses that don't have these distance scales. And manual focusing is a much more complicated process when you're using these mirrorless systems. So some folks might actually have to do autofocus um, to, to do their focus stacking or even to set their hyperfocal distance. Um, you know, so the thing about autofocus is that the camera is determining where you focus. And you have some control over where 
you know, what autofocus point you can select, but you might not have a lot of precise control picking the specific area where you want to focus. And that's best done with manual focus. All right. Our next question is from Diane, who asks, how do I change the lighting slash setting so that the objects in the foreground are not blacked out by my bright background? OK. So Diane, this, uh, this gets us back to what I was talking about earlier with balancing your exposure. So a graduated neutral density filter is an option there. So you pull the grad down over that bright sky. It darkens it, and that is going to help balance the exposure with your shadowed foreground. Another option, a lot of photographers, instead of using grads in the field, they'll do exposure blending, where they take multiple exposures of the same shot, hmm. but all they're changing is the exposure value. So they take one exposure for that bright sky to make sure it's not blown out and completely white, and then they take another exposure of that darker shadowed landscape to make sure it's not completely black, and then they blend the two together. It's actually really easy if you're using Adobe Lightroom. You can select these multiple exposures and then use the merge to HDR feature. And HDR is, is basically, it's, uh, it means high dynamic range imaging. And so it's a process of blending multiple exposures to uh, capture a greater range between light and dark than the camera sensor can capture. So you can use a, 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 a Sorry, I'm going porky pig here. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My mouth is getting a little dry. I apologize, everyone. Um, you can uh, use a, an HDR program like Photomatic. So there's a bunch of other pro programs that are out there. Or you can just do the merged HDR in Lightroom. Uh, Photoshop also has a merged HDR feature. So all of these things will auto blend those multiple exposures, giving you more dynamic range, more ability to capture light and shadow at the same time. But the easiest way for you to do this so you don't have to muck around with all this computer <laughs> stuff is to get a graduated neutral density filter. You just pull that down in front of the lens and you pull the dark part of the filter down over the sky and then that'll help balance your exposure. All right. Our next question is from Jim who asks, um, have you ever photographed the northern lights and do you have any recommendations for settings, lenses, or any tips on how to capture them correctly? Yes, I have photographed the northern lights. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a uh, photo that I can immediately produce to prove that. <laughs> but if you go to my website, you'll, you'll see, uh, I think there's one up there on my website, maybe two. Uh, and so obviously the northern lights are at night when things are very dark. Uh, and the settings that you need are going to vary depending on the intensity of the northern lights. Uh, it also depends on whether there's any ambient light, like for example, if you're shooting during uh, when the moon is up. Um, so I can't give you any hard, fast settings. But uh, generally, you're going to be shooting with big apertures. Uh, the bigger the aperture, the more light that is let in. And you might have to bump up to a higher ISO. And you will definitely be doing long exposures to capture the northern lights uh, in most circumstances. What you want to avoid, if possible, is having exposures that are much longer than 15 or 30 seconds. Because the northern lights, they dance across the sky. And if you're doing a very long exposure, let's say like two minutes, as the northern lights move across the sky, you won't be capturing the distinct shapes that emerge. Instead, all of that cumulative um, Activity in the sky will create this big green blur across the sky during a very long exposure. So try to keep your exposures to 30 seconds or less, even better, 15 seconds or less, so that you can capture the distinct patterns as they emerge. Usually there's enough stability for about 8 to 15 seconds, so you can capture that in a single exposure without too much of that blurring. Uh, but if you go longer than that, then you're going to lose those shapes and just get this green blur across the sky. All right, our next question is from Erica, who asks, what are some good lenses and settings for wildlife portraits? Uh, well, that's a really open-ended question. question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how far your subject is mm -hmm. away, what camera system you're using, uh, what level of magnification you want in the final composition. So I, I guess I, I really can't uh, answer that. All I can do is give some general thoughts about doing wildlife portraits. Uh, some techniques that you can use. It's better to have a lens that will give you a really wide open aperture because that bigger aperture will blur the background so you can have selective focus on your wildlife subject and the background which could potentially be distracting will be an artistic blur instead. So a lens that will give you f4 or f2.8 is really great for wildlife photography. And the advantage of having a longer focal length 
is that you don't have to get so close to get that tight portrait of the animal. Mm -hmm. And also when you're working with a longer focal length, uh, the magnification is much more extreme than with a smaller focal length, so it's easier to get that blurred out background as well. So these are just two considerations that you might have. Personally, I love doing wildlife photography with a lot of lenses other than my extreme telephotos. I even do, when I, the opportunity arises, I love doing wide-angle landscape shots that show the animal in the context of its environment. I'm trying to create a, uh, a composition where the animal is just one object within that composition. Make a story. Yeah, know. exactly. Tell more of a story. So uh, definitely think, I encourage you to think beyond just the mere tight headshot portrait mm -hmm. of the animal. I mean, you can, you can take those shots at a zoo and no one would know any yeah. different. So I think, um, I, you know, I definitely encourage people to think about going a little bit wider with their wildlife subjects, showing more context, more of the story of the animal, and showing more of an interesting composition as well. All right, our next question is from George who asks, how do you plan your photo trips and or pick where you're going to next? Do you have any rhyme or reason? Well, there's, <laughs> there's very little reason in anything I do in my life, well, um, but I do rhyme a lot, just ask my wife. You do rhyme a lot? <laughs> do you really? <laughs> yes, that, that was the joke, though. Oh, ha -ha. Get it? It rhymed. Ha -ha. Life and life. She's a little slow. Sorry, I wasn't really paying attention very well. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> um, yes, so there, there, there may not be a lot of rhyme or reason yeah. to my decisions. I, I, sometimes I tell people I just go wherever the wind takes me. Okay. But I, I do have kind of, like, generally I have this running bucket list of places okay. that for whatever reason capture my attention. But when I do pick an area that I'm going to go photograph, uh, I, I do spend a lot of time researching that area. So I have a good idea what my photographic opportunities might be. When I say reach, research the area, I don't necessarily like looking at the photos other people have taken. Mm -hmm. You know, I might look at tourist photos or just casual photos just so I can get a sense for what the landscape looks like or what my subject might look like. But I tend to avoid looking at what other serious photographers are doing. Because when you see someone else who's taken a really great shot, the only thing you want to do at that point is to go and get that exact same shot. Yeah, all you think about is that shot. Yeah, either. yeah, you covet that shot, you want it. Um, so I, I try to avoid that. I try to approach everything with my own fresh and unique artistic vision. So my research tends to be more general, just background research about the landforms, if, let's say I'm shooting landscape, I might do some research about the, some of the landforms. I look at satellite maps a lot, aerial views that you can find with any sort of mapping software. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at the satellite view, so I get a feel for the complexity of the landscape. This is also a great way for planning drone shots because yeah. you can actually preview your compositions by looking at the satellite map. Sometimes I'll look at the satellite map and go down to the, the very detailed level on the map and say, you know, I like this landform from above. I think that's going to make a really great composition. And I just go and find it with my drone and take a picture of it. Um, but even if I'm doing land-based photography, the satellite map gives me an idea about the complexity of the terrain. So I'm looking for areas that are going to have a lot of raw material for me to work with. So I'm looking for terrain that seems interesting, that seems to have a lot of different you know, possibilities, a lot of variations. So when I go there, I've got a lot to explore, a lot to work with, and a lot of opportunities to find my own unique compositions. And I probably plan more now than I used to, but I still wouldn't call myself a big planner. The planning <laughs> I do tends to be just enough to give me a feel for what the uh, area has to offer, but then I like to get on location and then just explore to find the things that appeal to me. So I do a lot of reacting to what I find. And I would say that if I am doing planning, most of it is on the ground when I'm scouting the locations, trying to find those really interesting, compelling compositions, and then going back to those spots over and over until I get the right light. So that's where most of my planning is. You don't ever just like take a dart and throw it at a world map? Uh, <laughs> sometimes it feels that way, but <laughs> usually what happens is I'll like, I'll see a story in National Geographic, okay. or you know, maybe I'll be watching some special on the Discovery Channel, and they'll be doing it on something, and I'll be like, wow, that looks like a cool place. I've yeah. got to go check that out. Yeah, because like this year you were in like Norway and Ethiopia, weren't you? Were you in Ethiopia this year? Was that last that year? That was last December. Yeah. So I feel like quite a change. Just curious on how you get from place to place like that. Just yeah, like, like Ethiopia has been something that's been kind of on my radar screen for a while. Yeah. I've been just interested in going, and then I finally decided, hey, what the heck? Why not? I'm going to go yeah. for it. I think I, I had a layover flight in, uh, in Ethiopia 
And so I said, well, all right. You better I've come back and do it right. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> and you know, I've got upcoming trips. I'm going to be yeah. in. Uh, I'm going to be in Kenya and Uganda uh, in just a few days. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Kenya in a few days. Uganda another week after that. And then I'm going to be going to the Faroes Islands in November. Then the Canadian Arctic for polar bears in late November. Um, then maybe in going to Jordan in January planning a trip to Mongolia in February, because Minneapolis in winter <laughs> isn't cold enough for me. You have to go me. somewhere else. I want to go somewhere else. So Seems I, like you have a pretty good plan here. You made it sound before like you were just like, I just float like a leaf in the wind. Well, I, I, <laughs> no, I do. I've got a plan that only lasts about four or five months. Okay. Uh, yeah, then the, the plan falls apart, and then it's all that leaf floating thing. All right. Yeah, okay. so. Good to know. All right, I think we only have time for one more question left here. All right, here. one and more. It's better be a good one. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> we, we've talked a lot about, about focus stacking in this episode, uh -huh. and Helen came in a little late. And can you just do, we've talked a lot about focus stacking techniques and software, but can you just like do a quick and explanation what is focus stacking okay so focus stacking is a process in the field and also later on the computer where you take multiple exposures of the same photograph mm -hmm. the only thing that you vary in those photos is where you focus the lens and then you combine those multiple exposures together on the computer to create a single image where the sharpest parts of each of those exposures blended together so you have a resulting photograph that is sharp through the entire image frame. So focus stacking basically accomplishes what photographers, landscape photographers, have been doing for decades now. In the old days we had those, those big old uh, fashion cameras that Ansel Adams used and you could independently move the film and the lens planes that would allow you to achieve these really striking near far focus effects. And in the digital age uh, we've lost most of that, or you can go out and buy something called a tilt shift lens, which will give you some of that functionality. Mm -hmm. So, but with digital cameras, we have to rely on hyperfocal distance and depth of field to get that near far effect. But depth of field is limited uh, because of various things. I mentioned diffraction earlier, which is that slight uh, softening of image quality when you use really small apertures. So that's going to limit how much you can get sharply in focus. There's also some peculiarities of lens design that make your corners look really mushy. It's called field curvature. So focus stacking allows you to do what Ansel Adams used to do, uh, allows you to do what you can do with depth of field, which is imperfect. Uh, focus stacking allows you to get that really intense, near, far, deep focus effect for each and every landscape photo that you make. Everything perfectly sharp in focus. So it's a great technique to learn. If you want to learn more, check out my course, Focusing for Landscape Photography, available on the OPG shop. It is a really helpful guide to learn all about hyperfocal distance, depth of field, all that old-fashioned stuff, which you still need to do on occasion, because not every yeah. scene is going to work with focus stacking. Uh, but it also teaches you how to focus stack, really simple, uh, no-nonsense approach to teaching you all these things. It will allow you to make perfect landscape compositions that are completely sharp throughout the entire image frame each and every time. So I think that is all that we have time for. I want to thank you once again for a thrilling and exciting episode of OPG Live. I also want to thank Tamron, our sponsor. And we can't wait to uh, have another event. We'll be back in October. Yep. And looking forward to hearing from all of you again, answering your wonderful questions. Thank you so much for your support. I'm Ian Plant. And I'm Lilia Khalif. And thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.